Thank you very much, Andre, for the for the very nice welcome. It's, um, very grateful for the invitation. I'm grateful to see some old friends. I see Elizabeth, who I haven't seen for a couple of years, and Patrick, and doubtless there are others I, I have a name referenced in the room. So it's wonderful to be back in Montreal. I've had a couple of visits here, largely thanks to Andre and his amazing ongoing project on electoral integrity. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here. And I'm going to start with a warning note. As Andre sort of intimated in his opening remarks, this is a new area for me. So this has been a voyage of discovery. Um, and actually, it's quite um, instructive for me to be t talking in a centre like this. I mean, what Elizabeth, you've created here is, is quite a wonderful operation. Another reason for me to be jealous of you guys. Um, the Centre for Democratic Citizenship, because it's, it's exactly in that vein that this research project um, that I've been engaged in, in for the last couple of years uh, started from. And, and it, it's sort of a project that's looking at democratic renewal. I suppose that's the way I would conceptualise it but democratic renewal in my home country. I, I, just let me start with a, um, a personal journey and then get into the meat of what it is I'm here to talk to you about, which is um, a personal journey that started in Canada, in British Columbia, uh, the early part of this millennium in, a, in the British Columbia Citizens' Assembly that Ken Carty was the research director of. And I know both Patrick and Andre were involved in the great book that uh, Patrick was the lead author of that came out of the three citizens' assemblies that I'll be making some references to today. And I was very fortunate to be called as an expert witness to each of those three citizens' assemblies because of their focus on electoral systems. I'll say more about them later on. But that put on my radar for the very first time the potential that deliberation could have in um, discussions about constitutional reform and institutional reform in democracies. And at the time, I was based in Britain. As, Ma as Andre said, I was in Manchester. I was in Manchester for 21 years. I believed I was going to be buried there. I was there you know, I'd long since given up any notion of ever getting back to Ireland. And then I finally got back. What forced me to leave Ireland in the 1980s was a deep recession. There were no jobs, so I had to get out of Ireland. And I spent 21 years looking jealously at my colleagues in Ireland during the Celtic Tiger period, this very wealthy country. And I finally got back in... Uh, 2009. <laughs> so I, I got back just in time to be back in, in the middle of another recession. Um, and in a sense, going back into Ireland um, at a time of existential crisis, I don't exaggerate. There was, there was a period when public servants weren't sure if we were going to get our paycheck the next month. That was how bad the economic mess that we were left in uh, hit in 2008-2009. And um, there was a lot of anger. Uh, you know, we didn't bang bin lids and protest like the Icelanders did, but there certainly was a huge depth of anger among the Irish citizenry um, about the mess, about the failure of our political system. And political scientists decided to mobilise as academics. There's only so much mobilising we can do, but we, we thought we had a skill set to bring to the debate, which was a skill set relating to debates about processes of reform and how one might go about reform. If the citizenry are angry, our rationale was, why don't we use the citizenry in debates? Why don't we engage with the citizenry in debates about institutional reform? And it, what's been very instructive for me in the years since our endeavours that started in 2010, 2011, is how the same sort of debates have been starting in a number of other countries. I was doing a list when I was flying over last night. I was trying to remind myself of the cases. Belgium, the G1000 project, Estonia, Iceland, Portugal last weekend had a citizens' assembly. Uh, the United Kingdom had, had a citizen assembly uh, project about two years ago. So there's a growing number of countries that, in many cases, independently and individually, are, are opening up to this idea of involving citizens in processes of, of debates about reform. And, and so where I put this is in, you know, the sort of work that Andre and I know certainly in the past, Elizabeth and Patrick have done and, and I've more normally done in the past, has been looking at the vote side of democracy, uh, the, the role that citizens have in voting. And what this project is, is trying to engage in is the voice side of democracy, giving citizens a voice in, uh, in, in debates about constitutional reform. So the, where it starts, I mean, deliberation, the deliberative turn and all of that I know goes quite a bit back, long before British Columbia. But I think where this particular journey that I'm talking to you today about starts is, is with the British Columbia Citizens' Assembly, followed quickly thereafter by the Dutch and the Ontario Citizens' Assemblies, all within a few years of each other. And what was interesting about those three Citizens' Assemblies, and is pointed out in Patrick et al.'s book very strongly, 
is one of the weaknesses of the approach of the Canadian and Dutch Citizens' Assemblies was the fact that they were exclusively oriented around the citizens. That politicians were specifically excluded. Politicians were, if, if, a, if a politician were one of the ones shortlisted to be a, a member of the Citizens' Assembly, um, the, the politi that politician would not have been selected. So politicians were specifically excluded. They were not invited to engage in the debates about it. And what you got as a result of that was at least two impacts, which is outlined in Patrick's book. One is a question mark over the realism, the realisticness of the output of those citizens' assemblies. The extent to which the, the, the members of the citizens' assemblies, whether they really understood the complexities of the electoral systems that they were proposing for their provinces in the two Canadian cases as citizens, but not as politicians, whether they fully understood that. So how realistic were the outputs? And secondly, the fact that because the politicians were excluded from the deliberations, it was very easy for the politicians to then exclude themselves from the referendum campaigns, which they very happily did so. So they killed it. They killed the proposals by not engaging in the debates uh, because they felt they had no ownership of it and they were able to use that as an excuse. And that was, that was evidently one of the potential weaknesses of it. So this is where we get to the Irish case. So here, just focus for a second on that photograph because you'll see another photograph a bit later and it might look a bit familiar. But this is a photograph from your average weekend of the Irish Constitutional Convention, established in 2012. And the way I'm trying to portray it in this draft presentation to you is in terms of, a, of an interesting paper that I came across quite recently in the European Journal of Political Research by Carolyn Hendricks. Um, in which she uses the phrase designed coupling, which is the essence of the title of the paper, where she talks about um, designed coupling where you're, 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 you're connecting two deliberative sites or various deliberative sites um, through some sort of institutional mechanism. And in Hendricks's paper, uh, she talks about an Australian example that she was engaged with. Um, but Danish consensus conferences perhaps would be another example of designed coupling. And, um, what, what I'm going to suggest to you today, but you can attack me afterwards whether you think this is just rubbish or not, is uh, that the Irish case is also an example of designed coupling. It was, uh, what we had in the Irish case was a mix of politicians and citizens. So in that room there, you have some very senior politicians. There was one government minister. There was uh, the leader of the Sinn Féin party, Gerry Adams, was a member. Um, you had uh, the chairperson of one of the major parties. You had politicians of all ranks. 33 of the 100 members were politicians who self-selected. They self-selected, they decided. So each party was given a quota based on the size of the party in parliament. And the politicians then volunteered for the role, or in the case of the Labour Party, put themselves forward for the Labour members to elect them. So 33 of the members were from parliament and 66 were citizens selected by an opinion poll company. So quite different from the citizens' assemblies. In this case, the citizens were totally blissfully unaware. Somebody knocked on their door and said, you're it. Uh, and in most cases, they were told to bugger off. But eventually, <laughs> eventually they found 66 worthy citizens who were prepared to, to join. And it was as random as you can make a process of selecting 66 people trying to fill quotas. They want a gender balance and all sorts of other quotas to be filled. So it wasn't a perfectly random sample. It was stratified in various ways. And I don't want to suggest um, that this was a beautifully, carefully crafted institutional design. This was pure party political uh, coming to an agreement. It was a coalition of, two, of the a coalition government of 2011 where one party had gone into the election of 2011 saying, we're going to set up a constitutional convention. One third members would be experts, one third politicians and one third citizens. And the other party said, we're going to establish a British Columbia style citizens assembly. So when they formed the coalition, they compromised. And the compromise was that one third would be politicians. The experts would play the role of experts, not as members, but to provide expertise. And two thirds would be citizens. So it wasn't a, a beautiful design, it was just a, um, a, the, the way it happened. So that was one way in which you had the coupling, it was the mix of the members. And the other was that the output of the, of the Constitutional Convention was in the form of recommendations that would go to the National Parliament. So it would be up to the National Parliament to decide on whether they're going to accept or not. So there's two areas of, of linkage, but it's the first of those that is of most uh, interest. And there were concerns, 
it's worth saying that. There were concerns as to whether this was a good idea or not. Many of us, myself included, felt this was the potential makings of a car crash. Because if you're sticking professional politicians with a, a bunch of ordinary citizens, you can just imagine what might happen. And indeed, there is an example from Australia in the late 1990s. They had a constitutional convention which mixed citizens and politicians together. And what did they do? They established parliamentary rules of procedure. So that's the risk that we were entering into, that the politicians would decide to use the method of operation that they were most familiar with. Um, so many academic observers, myself included, were saying the inclusion of politicians is a bad idea. The one exception, actually, was Ken Carty, who we have a video of him at a conference on the eve of the uh, launch of the Constitutional Convention. We organized a conference in Dublin. And on video, he says, actually, this might be a good idea. Let's wait and see what happens. And in the end, as you'll see, I think he was proven right. In the parliament, when they were debating the establishment of the convention, a number of politicians came out saying this was a bad idea. Um, one politician said the, you would get an undue bearing on the deliberations by the professional politicians. Another politician quoted Fung to say that um, you're going to have powerful participants who will distort the process and distort the outcomes. And generally, there was a fear that inclusion of um, the politicians was going to uh, distort the agenda and uh, lead to a lot of domination by one category of members over the other. So that's the context. That's where we are. This is the agenda. So the agenda was eight topics that was uh, set, by the, set by the government. So the, the government said, these are the eight topics. Now, at your leisure, look at the topics, and in the q and I'm happy to discuss why there are some topics and not others, but just I'll leave that hanging in the air for now. But anyway, government established the agenda. That's an important starting point here. Government determined how long they would have. So the essence of it was very unlike the British Columbia and Ontario Citizens' Assemblies. Each of these topics, in, in essence, was dealt with in one weekend. You know, so... Think about that. So later on, when I'm talking to you about change effects, you can see where my, my problem is. I'll come to that later on. Um, there were two other topics at the bottom, because at the end of its deliberations, it was allowed time to come up with other topics to discuss. So it came up with two other topics for two other weekends. But I'm only focusing on what's inside that blue box, because that's the bit that we were, fo that we were focusing our research on throughout. And I just want to draw your attention to a point of distinction that I'll come back to later between topics that we deem to be technical and those that we deem to be emotive. So there's a number of topics that we are making an argument to you for reasons I can go into later if you want, that some topics were, would lend themselves to more emotive language, more value-laden language, more value-laden discussion. And those are, those are the ones in the red box. So by all means, question me about it. I'm looking for suggestions and questions as we go along. So was it successful? Well, um, there were many critics of it, some of whom openly admit to having been converted in favour of it since and having become proponents, but there still remain critics of it to, to this very day. But I would make an argument to you um, that it was, and I'm not alone in making this argument, but I am biased. I was the research director. I had some involvement in its organisation. So of course I'm going to say it was wonderful. But it, it, it wasn't perfect, and I will go into that in the Q&A. But I'll make three suggestions as to, why, to you as to why I think it, it was successful. One was the outcomes. Because unlike, you know, British Columbia and Ontario had referendums on electoral system reform that failed. One of the outcomes of uh, the Constitutional Convention uh, was a proposal for marriage equality. And as you may have seen some of the coverage of that, we had a referendum in 2015 and it passed. Now, I want to suggest to you three points as to why I think the Constitutional Convention had to play an important role in making sure that that happened. One was our current Prime Minister, and who was then the Prime Minister, is a Conservative. His natural instinct, morally and socially, is Conservative. So it would be inconceivable to have seen him promote a referendum on an issue like this in normal times. So something changed him. And the argument is that it was the whole furore around the outcome of the Constitutional Convention debate about that, that in some, in some ways converted him, if not forced his hand. A second reason why I think the Convention played an important role in making this marriage equality referen referendum happen was because 33 of the members in the discussions of the Convention were politicians, party politicians from all the parties, government and opposition. 
So they all had ownership of it. So it made it difficult for the sort of inter party politics that you might otherwise have seen in our parliament, where opposition parties might have tried to use, tried to take advantage of the situation to campaign against. None did, they all campaigned for. And a, a third reason why I think the referendum, the convention played a role in the successful passing of the marriage equality referendum was because we have some limited, admittedly, survey evidence that shows that those who voted yes were at least aware of the existence of the convention. So there's some evidence that, it, that people were aware of it when they voted. Now, there were plenty, plenty of other topics discussed. In fact, the convention made, by some counts, a good 45 recommendations in a whole range of areas. Um, and at my latest count, I'd say about half of those proposals have been implemented or are being considered for implementation. So it's not just the marriage equality, although that's the most uh, notable outcome of the convention. So that's one way in which I would make the argument to you that the convention was a success. The other was, way of looking at it is to suggest to you it was a success as a deliberative process. And in other work that we're doing at present, we're looking at what's referred to as perceived discourse quality measures of perceived discourse quality. So here's just a, a sample of some of the measures that we were taking across all the weekends. This is just looking at the mean figures, where five is the maximum agreement with the proposal and, and zero is the minimum. And as you can see, it's pretty, it's pretty clear from one weekend survey to the next, a high degree of positivity. The sort of positivity I know that uh, the Citizens' Assembly has also manifested. So as a process of deliberation, the participants, the members themselves, politician and citizen, as you'll see later, excuse me, felt that it worked. So that would be an, a second way of saying that it's successful. And finally, why I would say it was successful is because it's been repeated. So there's that <coughs> hotel ballroom I showed you earlier on. Now it's green. It's the same ballroom I showed you. Because what's going on right now, I just came from the last meeting last weekend, is a new citizens' assembly that a new Irish government, the same prime minister, but a different Irish government, established late last year. So there's a new Citizens' Assembly. This time it's 100 citizen-only members. There's no politicians on this occasion. And it's discussing, at present, abortion. If you know anything about Irish politics, you will know that abortion is not an easy question for politicians in Ireland to discuss. And that's one of the reasons why there are no politician members on this occasion. No politician wants to be in the room to discuss this. But that's what they are, they are being given the brief to do. And they have other topics to discuss. So for me, that's a third reason why I would make the suggestion to you that the Constitutional Convention um, was a success, because uh, it's been repeated. The Irish government have set it up again. And now we get to the more difficult stuff. Um, and I'm reminded, in, in terms of how I frame it here, I'm reminded of a, a sort of one of those anecdotes, which may or may not be true, about a former Prime Minister of Ireland, Gareth Fitzgerald, who was a Prime Minister in the 1980s, who was an academic one of those wonderful examples of, a, of an academic who goes into politics. But academics, sorry, we have a certain thing we share in common, which is question marks over how realistic we are sometimes um, in, in the real world. And the, the, the story goes that the civil servants used to be driven mad because every time they presented um, Garrett with um, a report on something or other, his, his usual response apparently was, that's all very well in practice, but what about in theory? <laughs> And, and in a sense, this is the conundrum that the group I'm involved with of academics are presented with. Because if any of you have been involved in organizing deliberative processes, I, I was involved in organizing one back in 2011 where we got the funding, we organized the project, we organized the agenda, we selected the citizens, we ran the process. That's what you do if you're carrying out a deliberative poll or some other experiment in political science. You're, we're scientists and we're running a process as best we can. This was very different. This was a process where it was the um, government that established it, gave it its agenda, gave it the time period, determined its rules of procedure, and then gave it all to civil servants. And I'm going to have to speak carefully now because I think one or two of them might be watching the live stream. Um, but the civil service ran this and ran it very well. I, I, would, I, would, I would repeatedly say that. I think they did run it very well. But those of us who were trying to have some say from the political science perspective were in there under sufferance. So we had to volunteer our time. We had to try and find ways of edging our, our way in. So for example, we sold the idea to the secretariat that they needed to check whether people liked the coffee and the food and the hotels. So why not survey them each week? 
and could we just ask a few other questions while we're at it? <laughs> yeah. and, Sorry to the civil servants, I'm sure it's not, not, not exactly how it happened, but that's <laughs> roughly the sort of thing that we were doing. But the important point is that we had very little control over it. We had no control over it. We could just do our best to try and organise how it was going to work. And that is causing us deep frustration right now because we have pretty good material, and I'm going to show you some of it for the remainder of my talk, but it, we're having great difficulty in trying to develop a, a decent theoretical perspective around a set of data that we've gathered in a practical, empirical case, a real-world case of deliberation. So the, the way I'm discussing the topic today with you is this Fung phrase about the uh, powerful participants. To what extent did the powerful participants, the politicians, coupled with ordinary citizens, distort the process? To what extent did they dominate the proceedings? And I want to, I want to frame this around two hypotheses. So first of these, is a hypothesis which is developed from a project that's actually post-dated the Constitutional Convention and was somewhat influenced by the Convention, but now in turn is influencing this bit of our own analysis, which was a British project um, which goes by the title of Democracy Matters. It's Matt Flinders and Alan Rennick and I think Jerry Stoker and Graeme Smith and a whole bunch, it's quite a big group of them involved. And they got some funding from the British Electoral uh, Election, uh, British uh, Research Council, and uh, they carried out two uh, deliberative experiments in two cities, Southampton and um, uh, Sheffield, in 2015. And one of the city's citizen assemblies was modelled on the Canadian case, so all the members were citizens, and the other was modelled on the Irish case, so some of the members were local politicians. And they specifically wanted to test the merits of both approaches. They were trying to engage with debates in, in politics in the hope that Labour were going to be elected. Well, they, they didn't get elected, so Democracy Matters didn't get uh, uh, much traction, unfortunately, for them. But they found evidence from their survey data of the participants that the, um, in, the, in the mixed model, the Irish model, there was some sense that some members felt there was some domination going on, that some members were dominating the discussions. They asked questions about this, and when they probed, it seemed to be the politician members on the whole. So that led them to conclude that on the base of their research, at least as reported in the study they published on a website in 2016, 15, 16, that uh, the model that would be better one would be the Canadian model. Hence our first hypothesis. So we're, we're, we're going to examine the extent to which uh, those concerns happened in the Irish case. And I'll deal with that one quite quickly. And then the, the second one, which is the one that's really proving difficult for us, is um, it's based, up, based more on... Um, Going, going back into the research on deliberative theory, and, and in particular, a really well-considered piece that Jane Mansbridge and her colleagues published in 2012. It was a first chapter in an edited volume they brought out in 2012, which, where they brought up the idea of coupling, or at least they, it was the first time I saw it anyway, uh, the discussion about coupling. And it was, it was that that influences Carolyn um, Hendricks's work um, two or three years later. Um, and in the, uh, in, the paper, in the chapter, Mansbridge and her colleagues talk about um, the danger of the system being too tightly coupled, that's the phrase they use, too tightly coupled, because if the coupling is too tight, if, it's too if they're too close together, there's a risk of contamination, a risk of co-option even, a risk of a distortion of outcomes, that one side might dominate the other. That's the essence of the argument. And that's what we're, we're trying, trying to test uh, for in our second hypothesis. We have some data. We have two sources of data. So we have weekend surveys, what we call the before and after surveys. So the, the convention would meet from 9 o'clock, 9.30 on a Saturday morning until 1 o'clock on a Sunday. And so we had two time points of survey data in seven of the eight weekends um, where we tried to ask the same questions pretty much all the way through. Um, and that's our sort of response rate and a total sample of 403. And then the second was a, a much larger survey, our post-convention survey, so just at the end, we surveyed the members in, in more in depth um, about their experience and uh, there are response rates. Um, there's the, the, the N is bigger than it might seem because there was a degree of turnover, which I can go into if you want in the Q&A. So there were some, some weekends where the, the membership changed. That was just what, the nature of the beast that they created in this instance. So, so there's the two hypotheses. Um, and let me in about 20 minutes, um, try and take you through the, the, the two of them. The, fir the first one is straightforward enough. So the extent to which there was a domination of the uh, politician members. 
which might have decreased the quality of deliberation. And so here's, here's an attempt to tease it out a little bit. So we had the same question that the, um, the British study asked. That's because they used the same question we had asked, which was, to what extent did you feel that in your table, in your table discussions where there was facilitators involved, to what extent did you feel that there was um, a member or members who were dominating the discussions? And what we find is slight evidence, slight, really slight evidence, that um, citizen members as opposed to politician members, were more inclined to see a degree of domination. But equally, on the other side, slight evidence that, if anything, um, there were citizen members who disagreed with the proposition that was domination. So we don't find the sort of um, things that uh, Matt Flinders and their colleagues were finding. We look at those trends in more depth. I don't report it here, but we, we went on it week by week. And we find some evidence that on more technical matters, like electoral system design, in those weeks, you, there's a slightly greater degree of sense of domination, but it's ever so slight. We, we put into a regression um, the weak number, the types of topics that were being discussed in various demographics like age, for example, or, or sex. We find no statistical difference whatsoever in a regression model. So basically, we find, based on that measure, the same sort of measure that was used in the British study, no evidence of uh, domination, no evidence to support the first hypothesis. And the reason we would argue that perhaps the Irish case differs from the British, there's a number of points that I think are worth making quickly. One is theirs was a local city-based study where they're dealing with local politicians, local actors. Ours was dealing with national actors. Theirs was an experiment. Ours was a real world case. Theirs was over a very short period. They only had two weekends per city uh, citizen assembly. We had, as you can see, the best part of eight to 10 weekends of meetings. Um, and I think there's something to be said also, and this is a big plus point for the secretary to organize this. So, you know, big thumbs up to the civil service here, was the rules of procedure that they very carefully crafted for the Irish process. One really important point here was an agreement that decisions by the Citizens Assembly would be taken by a secret ballot. And that was crucial, because that meant that there was no danger of a party whip, because everyone was voting in secret. So there was no scope for party politicians in one camp trying to club together. You know, although in some instances there was a little attempt at that, but there was nothing they could do. It was a secret ballot. But it was more about the rules of procedure. The, 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 what was stressed as one of the norms of the process was equality of voice. You know, even the symbolic thing that everyone was there on first name terms. The name tags were first name. The surname was in small. Nobody was called by their title. So equality of voice was stressed in all ways. And I think that played a big role in, in ensuring that um, uh, there, there was a minimum domination. Now we get to the more difficult one, and the one that really, I'm really struggling with, and um, you'll see. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll be grateful for advice. Um, so we're now looking at whether uh, the coupling was too tight, the Mansbridge uh, worry about coupling and if you take it too far. To what extent did the inclusion of the politicians lead to a distortion of the process or some kind of distortion of the outcomes. That's the sort of area that we're trying to look at. That's how I'm framing it. So let me start with some preliminaries. Because we think that in order to, to look at this, to look at the extent to which there are significant differences between the politicians and citizen members, we need to control for other factors. So we control for, as you'll see later on, the types of issues, the emotive and technical, or indeed the individual issues. We control for the usual sort of demographics. We only have limited demographics, but we have sex and we have age. Um, and we also control for ideology. And there's a reason why we control for ideology, which may be particular to Ireland, but certainly is important in the Irish case, which is that we're dealing with a party system in Ireland which is notorious for its lack of ideological difference between parties. Irish politics is unique to this day, so we don't have a social basis to our political system. The rest of the world is catching up with us. We've never had a social basis to our, to our party politics. We don't have programmatic differences between the mainstream parties. They are Tweedledum versus Tweedledee. So from one election to the other, the mainstream parties will, will straddle that left-right center. Um, I'm oversimplifying, but I wanted to make that point that, that we have a, a question mark over the degree to which ideology is best summarized by party status. So for that reason, we wanted to individually measure ideological differences. So we asked in our post-convention survey a series of questions um, Oh, I beg your pardon, I'm going too fast. Those questions. 
we asked a series of questions of our, of our sample, um, which uh, we put into a factor analysis, and uh, we find one underlying component. And to give you a sort of a flavour of that underlying component, I'm sorry if this is a bit small, but um, obviously the slides will be shared later. We go back to the four items, you know, ch change worsens the situation, there is only one right answer. We worry too much about equality and we should respect the, what our founders did and not be bothering with too many new things and change and all of that. And so when we, when we plot our, our single dimension against the four components, we find a consistent relationship. That the higher you are on each one of them, the more you are moving towards the conservative end of the scale. And the lower you are on each one of those, the more you're moving towards a, a, what we might call, for want of a better term, a more liberal end of the scale, or certainly an end of the scale that favours change or a, agrees with the notion of change. So we're, we're going to suggest to you that um, we have an ideological measure that we're going to use here that distinguishes the members on a conservative to liberal um, scale. Um, we think it, this is why we think it's useful to use this, because when we look at our measure against one of our demographics and against our, um, our party status of our members, you can see it's, it's, it's rather all over the shop, particularly in the relation to the parties. You know, they're, they're sort of somewhat in the order that you might expect between left of centre and right of centre, to the extent to which you can use that term in Ireland. Um, but then the, it's, it's, it's not map, mapping on perfectly, so it's an, it's an independent measure of the degree of, um, of, of conservatism or not of our members uh, overall. And here is uh, what it looks like relating to the distinction between the citizen member and the politician members. So here we have the, the more conservative end of the scale and over there we have the more liberal end. And, and as you can see, the, uh, uh, the politician members on the whole were somewhat more conservative than the citizen members. So now we have a finding to play with. We have something that's of interest that the politician members on the basis of that analysis are somewhat more conservative than the citizen members. So now the question is, did that lead to an impact on the outcome of the convention? The fact that the politician members on the whole seem to be more conservative, did that influence the outcome of the convention in a way that distorted the process as an example of coupling that perhaps was too tight? So we have two sets of evidence. One set of evidence that is suggestive that it might have, and one set of evidence that suggests the opposite, rather helpfully. So let me take you through each in turn. So one is based on looking at our post-convention survey data, and the other is based on looking at our um, weekly, uh, our week and week, weekend survey uh, data. Um, so what, what, we, what we did was we, uh, we produced a regression. Um, and what we're looking at in this particular model is um, the likelihood that a convention member expresses a preference in favour of change. So we're trying to predict the extent to which a convention member, whatever member, expresses a preference in favour of change. And so if we just went with model one and stopped, we would have reasons to be rather happy that we've got something here. Because model one is suggesting to us that politician members were less supportive of change than citizen members, statistically significantly so. Problem is, once we put in our ideological measure, the difference between the politicians and citizens gets washed out. So ideology is trumping um, the type of member, citizen versus politician, in terms of producing the result. So we go to our third stage, and in our third stage, when we um, interact um, the, the types of issues, technical versus emotive, with the types of members, we do, we do find some evidence, some evidence to suggest that um, there's a significant interaction between emotive issues and politicians. That's what we're, we're suggesting. So that what this suggests to us is that politicians are less likely to advocate a change position on emotive issues. And the effect plots would seem to bear that out. So it would appear, therefore, that the politician members are less likely to prefer change on the more emotive issues when we account for their ideological position. Uh, and, and that's interesting, because that would suggest to us at first blush that the type of issue that's being discussed, an emotive issue, if it includes politicians in the mix, could lead to a distorted outcome. It is a, an outcome that is perhaps somewhat more conservative uh, than um, might have been the case if it didn't include the politicians. So that would potentially suggest 
some evidence in favor of hypothesis two. However, when we move to our other survey, our weekend survey, now we're looking at something quite different because the post-convention survey is asking the members directly after the convention has happened on each of these issues, did you favor or, or oppose them? And in some cases, we're dealing with issues that were, just, that were debated months in advance. The difference with the weekend surveys is we were asking them co contemporaneously. So at the start of the weekend, we were asking each of the members, what is your position on the issue you're about to discuss? And at the end of that same weekend, we we're asking the same question. So this potentially is a more useful data set, potentially, because this is the, the classic sort of deliberative poll type data set. We are trying to measure change effects as a result of a deliberative process. And on, at first blush, it's looking quite promising. 30% of the members shifted from being opposed to a topic, whatever topic, to being in favor, 6% moved in the opposite direction. But that's quite a, a sizable shift in the aggregate, at least, um, of members who are, who are moving um, in a direction of change. But when we start to look at this in a bit more detail, now it starts to get a little bit more um, interesting. So this, this takes a second or two, perhaps, to get used, used to. What this is looking at is, what was the pre-debate position of the members across the top. And then the second, what we have down below is what was the position after the debate? So the pre-date position versus the post-date position. So what we see, for example, here is that um, of those who uh, were in favor of electoral reform before the weekend of discussion, in the case of electoral reform, there were two weekends of discussion because it's slightly more complex. So we managed to persuade the secretary to have two weekends to discuss electoral systems. 25% um, shifted from being in favor to being against, and 18% moved in the opposite direction. So there's something interesting going on that we need to tease out further in other research on, um, uh, 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 on, on the, the change effects. And then we have some rather interesting things going on here. So we have, of those who opposed votes abroad in presidential elections, 33% shifted to being in favor. A uh, hundred percent shift, obviously we're dealing with small ends here, a pretty dramatic shift in favor of removing the clause on uh, women in the home. I'll, t I'll tell you about that if you want to know. Um, big shift on marriage equality. It was referred to as same-sex marriage throughout that process, so I'm using their terminology. And dramatic shift also in terms of women in politics. So there seems to be quite a lot of shifting in many respects in a quite liberal direction and particularly on emotive issues. Emotive issues moving in a liberal direction. And then one other slide. I'm nearly finished. The starting position of the, so this was the first survey each weekend, distinguishing the citizen members from the politician members. So a few things to pick out here. Um, politicians, as you would not be surprised to learn at the start of the process of discussing electoral reform, were much more inclined to be opposed to it than the citizen members. That's no surprise, you'd expect that. But this is what's interesting. Politicians, they were in favor of votes abroad, but they were in favor of same-sex marriage and in favor of steps to improve the representation of women in politics and public life at the start of the process. Two high-profile emotive issues, the politician members were on the liberal side on that discussion. And so then we tried to plug all of this into um, a regression analysis um, to try and see, you know, to try and beat every possible angle we can out of this. So here we're looking at the likelihood that a given individual will be in favor of a change after the debate, um, controlling for their opinion before the debate. So when we just look at politician versus citizen members, no significant relationship. When we try to interact type of member with um, the predate opinion, uh, no significant relationship. And when we try to plug in the usual sort of demographics um, and the particular issues that were being discussed, no significant relationship. So we can't find any evidence from, the, from this first foray into this um, that citizen members voted any way differently, or put it the other way, politician members <laughs> voted any way differently than citizen members in terms of the issues being discussed. So in, in effect, we're left with some rather curious mixed findings relating to hypothesis two. Let me just quickly summarize it before I shut up. On the one hand, we have our post-convention survey data um, that suggests that politicians were more conservative than citizens, and that suggests that politicians were less likely to advocate change 
on emotive issues. And that would seem to lend some support for the second hypothesis. However, on the other hand, from the weekend survey data, we find that if anything, the politician members were more inclined to favour change and more so on emotive issues. Although we don't have any support in our multivariate analysis, we just have it from the basic descriptive analysis. So we have a conundrum to explain. Now, this is unfinished work, and I did warn you a bit earlier on about this. One of the things that we need to include in this second stage of the analysis is our ideological measure. So we need to bring that in and explore to what extent that might be playing a role. And the other thing is that these, these data that um, we're using is one very simple battery of questions that we asked every weekend on this particular issue, on um, blasphemy, are you in favour or against? They were simple binary questions, which we asked every single survey. But in a given weekend, we were given space to ask two or three additional questions about the topic being discussed. And those data we now need to look at, because it could be that a more nuanced question about the particular issue might lend itself to um, richer findings than we're getting so far. So we don't know about hypothesis two. But otherwise, um, uh, what can I conclude from this? I conclude quite simply um, that there is no evidence. We've tried to beat it to death so far. We cannot find evidence that the inclusion of politician members in any way distorted the outcome of the Irish Constitutional Convention. And in that sense, as an example of coupling, it seems to have been a, an example that worked. Thank you.